Welcome to Top 5, a show where we exchange gifts and sometimes we drink a little cheer and sometimes we have some snacks. That's this have week's a Top 5, tequila, have a suggested tequila. by one of our listeners. Top 5 snacks Ooh. you as- associate with, and it says Christmas and New Year holidays, but how about we just say the winter holidays. Top 5 <laughs> snacks you associate with the winter holidays because uh, there are so many other denominations and maybe you have something that you enjoy eating uh, from uh, from another religion uh, if you are so inclined. Um, I'm going to start off with my number five. This is a long-standing tradition. Started with my grandmother, has passed on to, and I bet it's also for a lot of people in the United States. Then my my parents started doing it, and then my wife and I started doing it, and now we're doing it with our children. And that is every morning at the very bottom of your holiday stocking, you pull out this little rectangular box and it's maybe got a picture of Santa Claus on the front or a frosty or whatever, but then you open it up and there are two rows of lifesavers. Oh, the lifesaver book. Oh, I hate those. You know, what's cool about the lifesaver book, Matthew <laughs> is that? at least back when I was a kid. Yes. It would have flavors that you really couldn't get at the store. Like a, Cherry flavor or the butterscotch right. flavor of the whole roll the or the winter butterscotch is incredible. Yeah. Yes, and I will so, grant you that. And so it was really cool to always get that because it's like, oh, well, here's a regular pack of lifesavers. But, oh, look, there's a boysenberry flavored roll of lifesavers. They're the best. And what so the hell is a boysen and why does it have berries? I, I don't know. But um, boysens and that, girls is, and... that is a little snack, treat, candy, whatever that I always associate with the holidays because I don't ever see it anywhere else. And, and to be quite frank, when you're looking for the butterscotch or the raspberry or the boysenberry roll of lifesavers, you can't That's find them anywhere else scary. except for the holidays. That's not even a thing. The lifesaver book. That is my number oh. five. Rodrigo is here with us again this week. Hello, Rodrigo. Hey, what do you have for your number five? Uh, my number five is, uh, chocolate with some amount of mint in mm, it mm-hmm. um and that is uh partially due to a sort of contractual obligation <laughs> okay. um, i want to hear what this one is <laughs> because i am notoriously notoriously difficult to shop for um Ever since I was a little baby, my parents have never known what to get me. And because I've always had this face, even as a child, it was always just supremely disappointed, disappointing for me to get something. And then I'd be like, great. You know, and my parents would be like, well, crap. <laughs> um, so um, throughout the years, my parents latch on to anything that I express any um, positive, uh, the, anything that elicits a positive response, however minimal. And one year, a long time ago, my mom got me some chocolates with mint in it. Like those uh, like, kind of like thin mints. Yeah. Although right. they like make sig- like significantly like fancier versions of, of those. Right. Right. Um, and she got me some, she's like, did you like it? And I was like, yeah, it was great. Um, and then from there on out every year, I've gotten some chocolates with mint. And I like them just fine, but I never go out of my way to get mint chocolate stuff um, because I like it, but it's not something that I very actively seek out. I don't eat a lot of chocolate in general. Mm -hmm. Um, So now, almost every year, if not every year, my parents give me some form of, you know, mint chocolate something. Mm -hmm. And I eat it and I'm like, this is great. Cool. All right. That's Rodrigo's number five. Matthew, what do you have for number five? My number five comes from, well, it's actually of two things. Uh, Like so many things in my life, it's driven partly by entropy and partly by something that we've decided is tradition. Um, I don't know if you guys do this in your families, but sometimes you have to get somebody a gift and you have no idea what you're going to get them. Mm -hmm. And so you'll go and you'll buy... 20 of the same thing and give them to everyone. And when I was a child, the 20 of the same thing was an aluminum tin 
with a little cardboard divider in the middle and it had three sections, one buttered popcorn, one cheddar popcorn, one caramel corn. Mm -hmm. And everybody would get one because you didn't know what to get people. You don't know these people. I mean, you're only related to them and that, you know, only barely. And if you didn't look just like Uncle Mike with a beard or without the whole beard, because he has a whole beard and I have a partial beard, there would be no proof that there was any sort of connection between these people and me at all. So every Christmas for a long time, you'd get this big, stupid tin of popcorn and it's like 50 gallons of friggin' popcorn. So you'll be eating it for six months. Some years you'll literally have more than one. So you'll have popcorn left over for the next year. And for me, just that get some caramel, get some cheddar, get some butter. I don't even like popcorn. In fact, this may be part of the reason why I don't like popcorn, because you would get these enormous tins. And, you know, for a while they were all from Topsy's, which I believe is a, a Wichita concern. But anymore, you can walk into any quick shop or quick stop or stop shop or come and go or whatever you want to call it. You can find these for like three ninety nine. dollars yeah, uh, whatever you want to make the terrible, terrible pun about gasoline and then running for your dear life. You can also get a giant tin of tricolor popcorn, and that is something that always reminds me of the holidays and you know the inertia that is my family around the holidays. Who bought your popcorn this year, Matthew? Uh, nobody. No, oh. I don't have any popcorn as far as I know. Oh, okay. That you know... Well, you know, as previous top five episodes have shown us quite depressingly, I'm fresh out of parents. So, <laughs> I mean, it could be anybody. Um, yeah, but no. So other things I know I'm getting for Christmas, and that comes later in the list. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned popcorn, and, and fortunately or unfortunately, you mis- mentioned the, the popcorn company. So Ooh. Topsy's popcorn, cinnamon popcorn, mm. is actually my number one. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. Uh, I can get it out. I, I think uh, there's an, either an upcoming or a previous uh, top five where, where we ran through your number one. So we'll get my number that's one true. out really early. Number um, one killers is what we is. But see, when I was a kid, one thing that we would do as a family every year during the holidays is we would go up to... Uh, Crown Center in the plaza up in Kansas City. And for the people that mm-hmm. don't know this uh, area, it's kind of a high end uh, shopping area in, uh, I want to say Shawnee Mission. Uh, yeah. But uh, the they take of all of these Spanish style buildings. The whole plaza is done in the Spanish style. And it's really literally a dumping ground for sculpture <laughs> and water fountains and all sorts of yes. stuff. It looks really cool. It's a great place to go if you go to it. But during the holidays, they outline all of the buildings in lights and there's it's a big to do to have the plaza lit up every year after Thanksgiving. There's a, a special on one of the uh, Kansas city stations where they do this. And every year we would make a trek up to uh, up to the plaza to look at the lights and uh, we'd walk around all the little stores and things. And, and I would always go to this one bookstore and buy a doctor who book that I would read for, you know, a couple of months uh, but one of the stops we would always make before we went to go see a Santa Claus was at the Topsy's uh, popcorn store that was there. And we always got a bag of cinnamon popcorn. And mm-hmm. so that is like the main thing that I always uh, associate with the holidays is, oh, we're going to Crown. We're going to Crown Center. We're going to the Plaza. We're going to get some Topsy's uh, popcorn. Oh, boy. Yep. Good times. And again, this is maybe uh, when. As Matthew said, maybe popcorn, I mean, you can make popcorn at home, but the idea of a gourmet popcorn or a flavored yeah. popcorn was not something that you can easily do. And so cinnamon popcorn, holy cow. That's yeah, this is hand-sculpted hand popcorn. Yeah, hand-sculpted popcorn. Is what this I mean, stuff is. You can get caramel corn like during uh, Halloween. But well, you sure, get, but that's, that's gross. But you can only get cinnamon popcorn if you go to the plaza during Christmas. And so that's why Topsy's popcorn is my number one. My number four, however, is one that my mom does <laughs> all the time is um, every year, kind of like Matthew. What do we give people? Well, mom, I don't know when she started, probably like when I was four, she started making these tins of homemade cookies and sending them Aww. to relatives. And she would have an assortment of of one. She'd have these little sugar cookie ones that she'd. She has this press that she's literally had since the since the seventies that have these little dyes on them, and you'd squirt out these little uh, uh, wreaths or trees. Uh, those are delicious. Uh, she'd make snickerdoodles. She'd make you know a whole bunch of them. But the ones that I always again, 
Um, sometimes she'd make these at other times during the year, but the best time of the year was when she was making like 52 batches of no bake cookies because the whole house would smell like peanut butter and chocolate and oatmeal. And if you timed it just right, there would be like three dozen of them cooling and she would walk out of the room (laughs) and you would run in and you would just grab these warm, soft peanut butter, chocolate, oatmeal, no bake cookies. And you just be like, and you want to eat them then because once they get hard, they get really hard and not as good. But yes, I always remember my sister, my mom, or my sister, my dad, and I would wait for my mom to leave the kitchen. And then we'd all just sneak in and just peel these things off the wax as they were cooling and just ah, eat them all. Yep. So sure. no bake cookies, my number four. Rodrigo, what do you have for number four? <clears throat> my number four is also a cookie. Mm-hmm. It is a crumbly type cookie that my mom makes um i'm not sure what all is in it um but it's like a, you're pretty standard kind of like pecan sandy type yeah. thing yep um she usually makes like and this is like something that like the kids get get into like my nephews nowadays mm-hmm. um they kind of roll them up into the ball squish them down a little bit and then afterwards <laughs> um they uh they get covered in a very fine sugar but it's mm-hmm. not like it's not like that white like donut it's not pow- sugar it's, it's not powdered like, sugar yeah it's it's something slightly i think it's like a mixture of like powdered sugar and cinnamon mm-hmm. um and yeah i they're great and you know i, I think my mom starts making them on like December 10th and there's just like steady batches of them coming out until after Christmas when uh <laughs> when everybody's like completely stuffed. Yeah. So yeah, definitely one of my one of my faves. Very cool. Matthew, what do you have for number 4? My number 4 is not traditional to my family of origin but has become traditional to my family of nucleus. And that is to say the people that I've been living with for the past 13 years. And it's something that I always grew up with that poo poo kind of turn up your nose. What's this ridiculous, terrible stuff. I don't even know what a nog is and how you get an egg into it. But for some reason, Sarah always has to have eggnog around the holidays and she will go and she'll sample different kinds and different varieties and there's different flavors and different textures and she will bring these things home and we'll have three or four cartons of eggnog floating around Mm -hmm. we're a we're a very we're a very fat household i mean seriously uh but it's always interesting to me to try different mixtures and different consistencies of the eggnog and i've come to a point where it's it's totally the holidays for me and it's not always a good sensation sometimes you get one with too much vanilla or too much you know viscosity or not enough viscosity where it's just kind of like ew Mm -hmm. you're drinking the bottom of the coca-cola container when there's like that sludge at the bottom you don't want that but for me eggnog is one of those things that i've never wanted i don't necessarily ever crave it i don't say to myself i really need to go get me an eggnog right now but October, November, December, sometimes I'll be like, well, she's going to be bringing the eggnog home. I kind of, okay, I want some of the eggnog. Let's see what it is this year. You know, something with, with a lot of cinnamon, a lot of cardamom, maybe a little bit of rum that makes me talk like that. I don't know. But yeah, eggnog is one of those things that I never crave. But if I do crave it, it's around the holidays and I lie about it. Yeah. My nephew is a fiend for eggnog. When we went to um, uh, my in-laws for Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. the re- one request was to buy a couple of cartons of eggnog. And I'm like, ooh, who's going to drink all that eggnog? And man, if he, that kid in the first half day that he was there didn't down a gallon container or not a gallon. What's yeah. the square ones? Uh, the square ones are a, uh, a half, like gallon. A half, half gallon. gallon. Yeah, he downed a half gallon of eggnog just by himself. Oh, um, those are so great. Those just, the, Like the, the cardboard ones? You. Yeah. Enjoy it while you have the metabolism. Yeah. Oh yeah. And he has the metabolism. He's at that age where, I mean, he Mm -hmm. eats, he can eat five times 
everyone else in the whole household and is still mm. rail thin. So oh, good for I hate him. him already. I, I remember those days. And I, I don't know if it's like cardamom or, or like all spice or it's probably the all spice. There's something in there that just has this really, really wonderful kind of spicy back of your throat. Yeah, that was nice. Mm -hmm. And if you do mix it with rum, sometimes you get an even better mixture. You have to be careful. Uh, my wife actually mixes the rum way too hot. So the first cup, you're like, ooh, too much rum. And the second cup, you're like, you know what? I love you people. I love all you people. Yeah. Just shut up. You know, so it's less of an issue with the second cup, but still. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think a lot of my, the snacks that I associate with the holidays really have memories going far back to when I would just hang out at my grandparents' house. Uh, because one that I always remember is sitting in the, in their little living room area watching TV and then hearing my grandma in the uh, kitchen, just all of a sudden you hear this bang, 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 bang. And you're like, oh, what's grandma doing? And you'd smell this great smell coming in from the kitchen and you'd go in and she would have this giant cookie sheet just covered with this uh, caramel and peanuts and she'd be breaking oh. it with a giant wooden spoon to break them into giant chunks. And of course she made hers where, I don't know, there's a, somebody at my wife's work that brings peanut butter, but brittle to her every year. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's rather soft and it's, you know, it, it breaks easily. I remember like my grandmother's peanut brittle, you kind of had to suck on because it was yes. like super, super hard. And if you tried to bite it, yeah. you, you know, you'd pull out if you had, of course, my, my grandparents both had dentures. You'd pull your dentures out from trying to yep. chew it. So it was always kind of like a sucking candy. But it seems like the peanut brittle today is more literally brittle. More brittle. Yeah. yeah. And, um, but I still, I love peanut brittle. And uh, my wife comes home and literally one of the patients just brings this giant tin of homemade peanut brittle to like every member of the staff. And she just comes in and just hands me the entire container because she's like, well, I know that you're going to eat this the most. And so mm -hmm. I get the first dibs on the giant pieces of peanut brittle and mm, peanut brittle. <laughs> Anytime other than of the year, if you ask me if I wanted peanut brittle, I'd say, no, I'll pass. Uh, but once the holidays roll around, when it's between, it's literally between December, December 1st and December 31st, bring out mm -hmm. the peanut brittle. That is my number three. I think it's molasses. Maybe I that's think what that it there is. was. Molasses and nobody uses molasses because my grandma was one of those use it up, wear it out, mm -hmm. uh, make it last or go without ladies. Mm -hmm. And she would make a peanut brittle that you could literally use to side your house, yeah. but it was incredible. It was delicious. Mm -hmm. And you know, and her food was all like that. Her brownies were just gorgeous, scrumptious things, but they'd make fine break linings if you had to in a pinch. So I think it, some of it is the old school components like the, the molasses and the lard and the, you yeah, know, the maybe side that's of what it is. I just remember like my grandmother was literally out there with a giant wooden spoon and some year she'd have a little, uh, tack hammer <laughs> bam, that she'd bam, be banging bam. it to try to break it up into the little pieces. And it's like, wow. Okay. You go grandma. Yep. Rodrigo, what is on your number three? My number three is a, uh, Something that is, as I understand it, always around my parents' house, uh, especially now that my nephews uh, are, are always around. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, the only thing around my parents' house is my siblings. Yeah. Ugh. Um. It is, uh, it's called Cajeta, mm -hmm. and it is uh, burnt goat's milk with sugar. Hmm. A lot of sugar. Um, so it is basically a like carob like milk based caramel, mm -hmm. if if you will, and uh, it is really excellent. It's it's incredibly thick and like in like just flooringly sweet. I mean, if you. And if you know someone that has diabetes, if you eat it, they might just go into a coma. <laughs> um, so, you know, I don't buy it a lot. Uh, more and more, I'm seeing it in stores. Oh, really? Um, so this is something you can now buy and you don't have to make yourself. This is, this is something you can now buy um, as, um, m as the uh, Hispanic slash Latino uh, food aisles expand um <laughs> just gaining gaining ground on the chinese mm -hmm. um 
it, this is this is becoming uh, easier and easier to find. Um, I, again, if you want to try something really, really sweet, I would strongly recommend this. They, it comes in squeeze bottles now because traditionally, um, one of the biggest issues with it is that it's really thick. Mm. Um, I mean, it's not quite dulce de leche, but it's pretty close. So now it comes in squeeze bottle, so you can take like a, a graham cr- cracker, or if you want to like just eat it at, in a sandwich, or put it on mm, fruit. Okay. Um, you can do that. Um, it is it is something, man. <laughs> um, and man. Uh, you know, it's it's something that I again I don't buy very often, even though it is it is more prevalent now. So. Usually, I only get it when I visit my family for the holidays. There you go. Very cool. Uh, Matthew, you have an item on your number three. I do. My number three actually dates back many, many years ago. And I discovered this recently. I don't know if you know this. Uh, At the time of recording, I have just turned 47. And all of the girls that I had crushes on in the 80s are now these 46 and 47 year old, really cute soccer moms. And I was on the Facebook the other day and I saw the girl, the first girl I ever had a major crush on from like the third grade. And, you know, I'm like, wow, she's in her forties. And then I realized, yes, so am I. But I remember this particular item being a holiday thing. And I remember part of the reason that I really liked it was that her mother and my grandmother, I think both worked for the hospital auxiliary at one point. And so she and her mother would always bring the peanut butter cookies Mm -hmm. with a Hershey's kiss stuck right in the middle. Mm -hmm. So you get the ones, you know, your normal peanut butter cookie with the fork marks across the top. And then when it's warm, you stick a Hershey's kiss in it. So it's a chocolate peanut butter cookie. And it, you know, looks kind of like a UFO from Close Encounters of the Third Kind or something. But, oh, it's so good. And if you get one that's just right where that Hershey's kiss is kind of melted into the, the fabric of the cookie. Oh, those are the best ever. <laughs> and then, you know, at the time, this was the early eighties. So yeah, Reese's that was like peanut a new, butter that cups. Was a new deal. Yeah. It was one of those new awesome things. They're like, Hey, you yeah. guys remember last year when we were telling you, you should put hot dogs in lemon jello. <laughs> well, forget that noise. We got a better one. We got this Hershey's kiss that they've invented and we're going to stick it in the middle of a cookie. And then you can make a tuna casserole and cover the whole damn thing with Lay's potato chips. Yeah. But the peanut butter cookie at the very least, they actually, um, where I work, one of the, uh, departments always sends my department who works with them pretty closely, a big mess of treats. And they sent us the plate of cookies just today with a bunch of peanut butter cookies with a Hershey's kiss in the middle. There were like five of them. And there are 10 people in the department. And I thought for a moment there was going to be a fight <laughs> over that last peanut butter cookie with a Hershey's kiss. And of course, because I just turned 47 today, we were celebrating my birthday. So I got that last one and I didn't have to go Rick James and choke anybody, but, Mm. oh, those are so good. And I'm just like, those are, those are like the holiday to me. They remind me of the holiday and Kara, who I had a terrible, terrible crush on in the eighties, who is now, you know, a mom and a nurse and a very nice lady from all, you know, appearances. I don't know. For but, you of, know, it's nostalgia. For those of you that are giggling over uh, hot dogs in lime jello or lemon jello. Um, that's a real that, thing, That's you a guys. real thing, but Matthew's <laughs> off by about a decade. If you go and do a search, <laughs> go and do a search I, for, I grew up in Kansas, and it was 1973 yeah. until the mid-80s yeah, there. That's true. Go go and look at the, like, um, bizarre foods of the 70s, and you'll just see <laughs> some, and you'll find, like, Pinterest pages. There's uh, somebody who yep. posts stuff on on Twitter quite a bit. And I forget yep. what it's called. Food, food from the seventies. Uh, it's seventies, seventies recipes or something. I know uh, yeah. Mela retweets it a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it will be like these un, unholy combinations with like lark's tongues and aspic mm-hmm. or something. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. Yeah, yeah. aspic. Ugh. Ugh. Blah, wanna, blah. <laughs> I don't know what aspic it's is. Jello. But it's, it's, it's jello, but it's made like, of meat, you guys. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's got meat suspended in it. Uh, oh yeah, it's uh, disgusting. Uh, just the weirdest foods in the 70s that you would have like dinner parties uh, 
weird dinner yes. party food, and it's just the weirdest have, like, thing to this, look at. Uh, this 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 thing of aspic that was shaped in like a bunt cake, and it's full of like mm-hmm. bits bits of meat and hot dogs and, and fur. And I'm, uh, yeah, I don't want it. I don't want <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. I don't want it. Oh yeah, go away. Just go, scary just go do a search. Uh, every household I know used to have one of those um like salmon um <laughs> molds that you yes. then use to make some kind of a salmon you'd like salmon like, mousse salmon mousse Ugh. yep yeah. i can't st- i can't eat salmon mousse after everybody died in monty python's <laughs> the meaning of life and they all had to get in their ghost cars and fly off into the great I, beyond and i'm just oh, i don't know mousse. if they just, still oh. do it but um i know my grandmother was doing this again it all goes back to my grandmother carrots and jello that's true do you ever do oh, carrots and jello yeah. Carrots and yellow, and and yellow or jello. green jello. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. Oh, good times. You know, good you can times. tell me that it's it's like it's just like carrot cake. I'm like, no, it's not. No, it's carrot it's cake not. tastes good. Yeah. Carrot cake is a food. Lime jello and carrots is just a, a cruel joke. It just seems like it's it. it's it's the food equivalent of a flaming bag of poo on your porch because you think, oh, what's this? Ah, fortunately, duty. Fortunately, but oh, so if we ever do a. Easter snacks that you associate with Christmas. It was always mm. the uh, shredded carrots in lime mm-hmm. jello. That would definitely be an Easter food. But we're on the holiday <sighs> food. And my number two. Different holiday. My number two is one that dates back to like 1952. Today you can still buy it. But what you buy today is not even close. Not even, <laughs> not even remotely close to the original Chex Mix. The original oh. Chex Mix is you take one box of all of the Chexes and you pour them in and then you take like four sticks of butter, throw them in, a bottle of Worcestershire sauce, <laughs> some, Worcestershire. Mini, m- some mini pretzels, and then a whole can of assorted nuts. And you pour all those in and you bake them at like, what, 350 or something. You turn it every every 15 minutes until it's all coated. I think there's a bunch of salt that you also throw in. Yeah, all the salt in the world. Yeah, all the salt in the world. But man, the original Chex Mix is so, so good. And if you ever get a chance to make an original Chex Mix, and don't go to the uh, to the Chex Company's website, or yeah. the, um, I think it's Betty Crocker, which claims to have, if you go and search for the original Chex Mix recipe, the one that they're comes lying. up is not. Because they're like, oh yeah, throw in bagel chips and cook it in the microwave. It's like, oh, whoa, 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 company. There was no microwaves in 1952 unless you were working for the government and frying aliens in the back of your secret laboratories. Yeah. There were no bagel (laughs) chips in 1952. There were two. (laughs) Bagels were only invented in 1950. Not bagel chips or those rye crisps. Those are the other ones. That's the other one. That oh, they, they like, oh, that was in the, the original Chex Mix. No, it wasn't. Those Wyback crackers or whatever yeah. they are. Uh, what so, else are you like going to do with rye? So, yeah, no, it's just the Chex Mix, some pretzels, the Worcestershire, the salt, the butter, and, and a whole <laughs> container of, of the mixed nuts. Because peanuts are fine in your, in your Chex Mix. Peanuts by themselves are fine. But if you can get a good cashew or an almond... That has been thrown into that. That was like the, the prize that you would search for. Nut? A Brazil nut. Sometimes, yes. Yes. Uh, some people. <laughs> like a I, whole avocado pit. Yeah. <laughs> some people, I don't know when, but some people I remember <laughs> used to start mixing in Cheerios in their Chex Mix. And I was just like, eh, I'm not really a big fan of the Cheerios in my Chex Mix. Those people are monsters. But again, my grandmother would make this and it would be like, I think my parents would go to like a holiday party or something. And so I'd get mm-hmm. dumped off at my grandmother's house and it would be late. And then somewhere around eight o'clock, eight o'clock late for a kid, right? Eight, eight year old kid, seven year old kid. Um, you're just laying there watching some TV with grandpa and grandma comes in with this little bowl of this really warm Chex Mix. And you would just sit there and you guys would just eat it together and laugh and watch it. You know, uh, Rockford Files on TV and it'd be good times. Uh, also, you could watch good times. But the original <laughs> Chex Mix. My number two, I still enjoy Chex Mix. Don't get me wrong, but the two just do not compare. If you had a Chex Mix out of the bag today and you had an original Chex Mix, you would be screaming to the heavens. What has this country done to screw it up itself up so bad? And I think the answer (laughs) is they tried to commercialize Chex Mix and make it sellable year round instead of forcing people to make it themselves during the holidays. Yeah. 
Make it your damn self in that's the oven. That's what's wrong with America today. That's, that's, that's what's why wrong. The original Chex Mix is my number two. Something wrong with this whole argument, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Rodrigo, what do you have for number two? Uh, my number two is apparently uh-huh. Quinn's Cheese. Quince what? Cheese. What yeah. is Quince Cheese? F- 15-year-old cheese? Oh, no. no. Sorry. No, that's that's Quince that's Cheese. cheese. Yeah. Right. So uh, in Mexico, this is called Ate, um, which is funny because it's spelled A-T-E. Mm-hmm. So it's which, just eight, which is just eight. eight. And it's funny because Quince is just Quince. I mean, it's not like they relate to each other, but right, it's right. funny that anyway. <laughs> um. Unless you happen to have eaten fifteen of these, you might. Then it kind of makes sense if you like quince. Uh, you lot. shouldn't. These, these. So, what quince cheese is? It's a paste mm-hmm. made out of fruit and sugar. Basically, it's it's hard to compare to. Think of like um, a really thick gummy, maybe, um, maybe like. Sort of the consi- like slightly firmer Turkish delight type mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, I've had this before. Yeah, I don't know that I have, but it's it's big in Mexico um, and relatively hard to find, uh, at least outside of like specialty stores. Yeah. So um, they don't always have it, but every once in a while, my parents will buy it. Um, and the tradition is sort of you. Take a slice of that and a slice of cheese, and you eat them together. And mm-hmm. it's good. It's very sweet. Um, and you know, with with the cheese, it's a it's a good good combination there. Um, I always liked it. I never really thought too much about it because living in Mexico is a lot more common than moving to the United States. Um, it's uh, not always around, and my parents don't get it every year. Um, but when they do, it's kind of a you know, it's kind of become a, a, a pleasant surprise to, to have it around. Cool. Hmm. Neato, neato. I, I guess I associate the texture. I guess um, I must have had it around the same time because I have if you've ever had like cactus uh, candy, mm-hmm. that's it's like sure. pureed and kind of yep. reformed. It kind of yep. has that same kind of texture, even though it's got a very different taste. Huh. Yeah. And this is like a little bit sweet and a little bit tart. Mm hmm. Um, a little little bit country, a little bit rock and roll. Yep. So, um, yeah, quince cheese. Uh, if you go, if you go to a Mexican store, ask for ate because you'll probably have more luck there. Right. And you know, quince cheese is probably Jack Klugman's signature (laughs) roll in the seventies. That that is another that is another good thing about it is that um, it sounds like a really low rent private eye. Yeah. Right. Um, Quince and, cheese. and you know if you go Man with about like the, town. if you go with like the Spanish version of it, which is dulce de membrillo, it sounds like a soap opera star. <laughs> oh yeah, I've seen her. Didn't she yeah. do like a, a nude shoot in Maxim a couple of years ago? <laughs> yeah, she did. Uh, oh. And of course, everybody turned on her because of it. <laughs> well, you know what? You have to admire her for her courage and boldness. Yeah. Uh, speaking of bold, Matthew, the bold yes. check mix. Not very good, but I bet your number two is a, uh, is a, is a bold item. Well, no, you can, you can put it in a bowl and then it would be bold. Um, my number two, and this is interesting. This is the second one on the list that is Sarah's freaking fault. And I'll tell you why you remember how I said in my number five, like, I don't know, six days ago, my family does the thing where they're like, we don't know what to get you. So here's a big dumb tin of freaking popcorn. Mm-hmm. She never knows what to get her. It's like somewhere between four and 19 siblings. I mean, they're all jerks. I don't keep track, but she never knows what to get her family. And it is a big, like extended family full of people and aunts and uncles and cousins and, you know, third cousins twice removed. And some guy who married a girl named Jill and you're not sure you're related, but he's still at the party. And so since she doesn't know what to do when she goes to the party, she would always go to the Walmart and get a case of chocolate oranges. Mm, mm-hmm. 
And if you've ever had a chocolate orange, you just went, oh. And if you've never had a chocolate orange, you have no idea what I'm talking about. This is actually, they're, they've, they're actually changed. And I don't want to sound like Steven here and say that it, everything has changed and now it sucks. But they actually changed both the size and the texture. But what they do is they cast chocolate pieces as slices of an orange. Yeah. And then they take them and they put them in a circle as though they were a complete orange and they dump liquid chocolate down the middle, let that solidify so that you have something that is shaped like an orange. But when you whack it really hard against something like a table or, you know, your, your brother, brother head. yeah, yeah, it busts apart and you get individual slices of milk chocolate or dark chocolate is my preference with this overtone of like an orange zest. And it's really wonderful. You don't necessarily think, Oh, oranges and chocolate go together perfectly, but they do. You guys, they totally do. <laughs> and each year it's gotten more and more of a pain in the patukas to get chocolate oranges for the entire, you know, family, the 37 people or whatever it is. And this year she has finally given up the ghost on getting the chocolate oranges, but there are still going to be four chocolate oranges that come into the house and it's going to be done whether she knows it or not this year, because chocolate oranges are a, a thing that we do at the holidays in my house. We have kind of a name for it. It's a, a weird mutant thing. We call it Krimica, but uh, the, the dragon comes every year and puts presents in your sock. It's a long and involved process, but in any case, chocolate oranges are one of my big holiday things, and that's why they're my number two. There you go. We have made it to our number ones. I've already talked about Topsy's Cinnamon Popcorn. Uh, So why don't we just slide on over to Rodrigo and find out what is the top of his list for uh, snacks that he associates with the Christmas, New Year, or regular holidays, winter holidays. Yeah. My uh, my number one is in the number one position, not just because it's a snack that I greatly enjoy during the holidays, but also because it has become the the central or focal point of a legend in <laughs> in our house. Um, and I'm talking about really any sort of canned uh, mollusk like uh, octopus in in ink or. Uh, like uh, smoked oysters in oil. Um, so what you do is you open them up, come in a tin, you open it, put them on a cracker, and you eat that, and it's great. Um, but uh, they've kind of uh, come to signify something like just uh, ruinous in my house, and that's because um, this is this is the way that, that I tell the story. A long time mm-hmm. ago... Um, my mom got a bunch of those and said, these are for Christmas. We're, on Christmas Day, we'll just eat them you know, for snacking or whatever. And I was like, cool. Um, and then on Christmas, I go downstairs and my brother's there and he's eating some. And I'm like, oh, cool. I'm going to have some too. And I open yeah. the pantry and there's nothing there, right? Yeah. So I'm like, what happened to them? And apparently he had just been eating them throughout the week that I was there. Um, so by the time Christmas rolled around, <laughs> there were none. And I was like, Hey man, you ate all the things, right? That's, that's what I hold happened. Um, but if you hear my brother <laughs> tell it, this, this has kind of, uh, jabber itself into this whole deal where I believe at first it was like that, but I became like very enraged about it. (laughs) Um, Then it kind of mutated into me just wanting all of them for myself. Like according to to the story now, I opened the pantry and it just overflowed with these, but I saw him eating some and I was like, I want those. Um, And then eventually (laughs) now I think the latest retelling of it is like, I was upset at him because of the way he was eating them. Like, he was just maybe eating them straight from the can, and I was like, no, you must have them on a cracker. Um, <laughs> and so so last year uh, was the first time that my girlfriend went uh, with me to visit my parents, um, and I got super sick. I just got, like, deathly ill. I was bedridden for, like, two days, maybe more. 
right? It's all a blur. But as I was like sitting there, like shivering, I was like, like she's like, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go downstairs, and I like grabbed her wrist, and I was like, my brother's gonna tell you a story about canned oysters. Don't believe him. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, okay, weirdo, and she goes downstairs. And later on, I when I came to, she was like, so your brother told me this story and it really doesn't sound like you. And I was like, I told you. <laughs> I like, this is like a, a, a rallying story for like my family. They have told this story over and over again every year since it happened. It's like... <laughs> I'm basically the Krampus in my house, <laughs> except it's just around oysters. The oyster um, Krampus. I'm the oyster Krampus. So um, I'm very much looking forward to going home this year and finding what new uh, wrinkle has been added to the story. I'm personally, I'm hoping that this time uh, my brother is eating it and the door flies open and I ride in on like a black steed <laughs> with like you know, one of those flails at the end of a chain with like <laughs> spikes on it. And I just slap, I just slap the can out of his hand with it. And I'm like, how dare you? How dare you? The sheriff demands his taxes or something. His oyster taxes. <laughs> so yeah, my number one can't smoke, smoked oysters and this giant story. There you go. <laughs> Matthew, it's up to you now. What is your number one snack that you associate with the winter holiday seasons? Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, we, we have alluded to the fact that if you go back through top five, you will find stories of how uh, I, I am like now a lone island in the universe and everyone before me in my family lineage has passed on. And among those people was my maternal grandmother, Grandma Peterson. Grandma Peterson grew up, um, and I, it's one of those stories where she grew up in the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl of Kansas. And when you grow up in the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl of Kansas, and you're a young girl and you have like five brothers, you become like a small housewife at the age of 10. And so in 1927, my 10 year old grandmother started baking. Now, when I was born, my grandmother was in her late 50s, and throughout my entire life, my grandmother would spend the whole year teaching rotten kids and then spend the month of December baking. And I am told that before I was born, she would bake all year round, and it seems like the baking area got smaller and smaller and smaller as she got older and her family got larger. And, you know, we're awful people, so I'm sure we probably wore her down like that. But one of the things that my grandmother would make was mince pie and i grew up thinking oh yeah it's it's christmas we're going to have a mince pie and i got to be about 16 17 and i stopped living in my grandmother's house and i realized that nobody else had mince pie and in my early 20s i stayed uh one christmas at carl's house and carl's grandmother made a mince pie and everybody was like oh Oh, it's so weird to have mince pie. And I'm like, no, mince pie is Christmas, you guys. And they all looked at me like I was crazy, which I was 21. I'm sure everybody did. But since that time, it has become clear to me. Three things have become clear to me. First and foremost, my grandmother was an excellent baker and chose to use this skill less and less and less, like Yoda with his lightsaber. You remember how in Attack of the Clones, he came stomping in on his cane and he wasn't able to move very much and then Dooku pulled out a lightsaber and all of a sudden it was Jackie Chan Yoda bouncing off the walls. That was my grandmother only with pie. Secondly, mince pie is apparently not a Midwestern Christmas thing anymore. And third, in the year 2017, in the city of Topeka, capital of the state of Kansas, or as we like to call it, the weathered and broken state of Brown Pakistan, oh, I you can you say not Topeka, the toilet bowl of Kansas. Oh shush. You're from Hayes. I mean, <laughs> you don't have a whole lot of moral high ground here. Kansas is a cesspool and we love it and we're from here and that's what we do. But you can't buy a mince pie. You can't go to the pie restaurant and order a mince pie. You have to give them weeks in advance and give them time to order the special ingredients for a mince pie. And it's gotten to the point where 
last Christmas, apparently there were special orders sent across the ocean to the United Kingdom, where mince pie is a thing. Mm -hmm. And the mince pie was mailed here (laughs) to my house. And mince pies are being imported from other countries. Last year, I think I got four different boxes of miniature mince pies with different sizes and different things and one had frosting and a big can of mince pie filling just in case none of those were right and whenever i bring this up everybody's like mince pie ew that's got like meat in it and i'm like does it no it's got like figs and nuts and stuff well apparently it has like a, a, a a base that's made of some sort of either meat jello or meat no. grease or aspic. I don't know aspic for aspic <laughs> yeah but people are like ew I don't like the sound of that and I'm like but have you eaten the pie well no eat the pie it tastes like Christmas yeah. you guys it's it's in, <sighs> I mean in, in, in Mexico they make mm-hmm. this thing called picadillo which is basically mincemeat right it's like that's mm-hmm. probably why they're thinking of it is because mince pie potentially as mince meat which is right. like uh like ground meat. up meat of some kind plus nuts and maybe like fruit and things like that mm-hmm. so i was like that that does exist in in other places but i i can see why people wouldn't wouldn't readily be into it in fact i i'm only into it because i've eaten it for like a lot of my life right like, thinking of it i'm like yeah that doesn't seem like things that would go together Right. And that's that's the thing about mince pie. It's got like raisins and currants and mm-hmm. it's got this spice in it that's all spicy with a spice texture and spices. I don't know what they are. I don't know what spices are, you guys. I think it's coriander, which is also the name of the orange teen type. Too. Cloves are definitely yeah. in there. But I just love it and it's so wonderful. And I'll you know, I'll go and make these jokes on Facebook. And my American friends are like, ew, mince pie. And then, like, literally from any other country, people will be like, oh, yeah, we can just walk down the street and get that. And, of course, all my British friends are like, oh, we can get the pie whenever we want. Oh. And then they make fun of me and they're mean. So I have to do their accent on the show and then so get letters. For- there is one of those um, British stores in Lawrence. Mm-hmm. Have you gone there to see if they have the mince pies? Instead of having you to actually can, ship all the way from, from England? You can get, like, the filling. You can get the boxes of them. But it's actually cheaper mm. to, to go on, like, the Amazon or the eBay, uh, I'm told. <laughs> Again, I don't know for sure. We had a really good one last year that had, like, a heavy kind of rum taste to it. Oh, it was so good. It came in a big black box. I'm having a show here, woman. What are you doing? All it's right. a mince pie. It's a mince pie. There you go. <laughs> it's a girl with All a right, pie. Everybody. There you go. There are our top five snacks that we associate with the holiday season. Ah, so many good things. I, mm-hmm. I, I guarantee that one of these, well, I've already had the peanut brittle this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, we probably won't get to the Topsy's popcorn. Original mm-hmm. Chex Mix. I don't know if my mom's going to make any of that, but uh, definitely I expect to get some no bake cookies. And if I don't find a lifesaver book in the bottom of my stocking, I'm going to be disappointed. But, and I will be personally cutting up some carrots and putting them in some Jello for you. There you go. Uh, but save it for Easter. Them to you save it for Easter. Box. Yeah, there you oh, go. It'll get there around Easter. Um, listen, <laughs> listeners, this is the last top five of 2017. We are so glad that you were here with us throughout all of the the lists and the numbers and the things that make everything fascinating. Uh, we hope that you have a holiday season, a happy holiday season. Um, <laughs> if you want to know more about that, listen to uh, listen to one of the uh, pre-shows over there at uh, uh, patreon.com slash major spoilers, where I talked about the weird things that were said at my kid's holiday party. Ah, interesting. Uh, but we're hoping that you do have a happy, safe, and wonderful holiday season from all of us at majorspoilers.com. Listen, head over to Major Spoilers, and in the show notes, in the comment section for this episode, we want you to share your top five snacks that you associate with the holiday season. Why? Because everybody's hungry and everybody loves a list. Take care. We'll see you in 2018. This podcast is copyright 2017 by Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC. 